Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. The Real Science Exchange is brought to you by Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health. Visit Balchem.com to see how our line of encapsulated nutrients, choline chloride, and chelated minerals can improve your bottom line. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. Production agriculture continues to be touted as one of the villains in climate change. As an industry, it's imperative that we continue to proactively look for ways to reduce our overall environmental impact to the planet. Tonight's discussion focuses on ways to improve protein utilization in dairy cows to reduce our overall environmental footprint. Back in October 2021, Dr. Chris Reynolds from the University of Reading joined us on the Real Science Lecture Series to share new research on this very topic. Chris, welcome to the exchange, and thank you for joining us tonight from the UK. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you tell us how a, a young man from Tennessee found his way to the UK? Um, yeah, it's a, there's a bit of a story. Which, which Mark, heard it. <laughs> Mark heard it before. Um, but uh, yeah, I was working. I started my career after doing my PhD at the uh, University of Tennessee at Knoxville, um, working at the Rumen and Nutrition Laboratory of the USDA ARS in, in Beltville, Maryland. There was a room, actually a Rumen and Nutrition Laboratory back then. We had about 16 scientists in the lab. Um, and um, I'd worked there for about nine years and an opportunity came up. Um, to move to the UK and work at the University of Reading. That was in 1993. Uh, they just established a, a, a center for dairy research um, and established a new metabolism facility. Um, and uh, it was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, people ask me, why in the world would you leave a, a really good position at Beltsville to go work in, in the UK and uh, work in a position where you had to secure uh, external funding to do your research? Uh, and I tell them it was uh, it was such a great opportunity to work with people like David Beaver and John Sutton and and work with the new facilities they just established. But the real reason was uh, in, in through previous collaborations in the UK, uh, I met my wife. Uh, I married an English woman, and it was easier to move me to England <laughs> than to move her horse to America. Yeah, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I love the UK. I think I, I could live there as well. I see you brought a guest with you tonight, uh, Dr. Mark Hannigan. Would you mind telling us a little bit about him and how you guys might have met? Um, well, I've known Mark for a long time, and I'm really pleased that Mark agreed to join join us tonight. Um, uh, and I. Oh, geez, Mark, we first met, I guess, at about nine, about the same year I moved to, to, to Reading or, or maybe the year after. It was at the, uh, at the meetings just before you went. So. Yeah. So, well, yeah, in, in Maryland, the, the, the 93 meetings. Um, and Mark uh, had was moving, I guess, when we met from, from Davis to a position with Purina. Um, and Purina was very much involved in one of the sponsors of, of a um, – a, a large collaborative project on uh, regulation of milk protein synthesis that, that we were working on. And so uh, I got to know Mark through what we call the snowball project at the time. Um, the project that we were on at the start was, was renewed. Uh, it was, a, I think it was a four year project or five year project and re renewed for another four years. And so Mark and I uh, collaborated on that project and then we've continued to collaborate ever since. And of course, Mark is now uh, in Virginia in a distinguished professorship. Yeah. Well, we thank you for inviting Mark. Mark, you're no stranger to the Real Science Exchange table. Uh, so welcome back. This, this has got to be uh, becoming one of your favorite bars, I would think. Um, <laughs> do you have any, any stories you guys can share? Um, any good stories that you can share about, uh, Chris? My, I'll start with my favorite one is that... Uh, Chris oh, no. just got married when he moved over, okay? And and so he now has children, as do I. And, uh, you know, like any good science uh, enterprise, I guess, you you tend to have a few things that get left behind, bottom drawers, John Sutton would refer to it. And so you, you always try to pull those out, you know, when you get a chance and get those done. And it seems like only a couple of years have gone by, but uh, I started uh, visiting each summer thinking, well, maybe we can resurrect you know, these four or five papers we still have left from that, that project and, you know, and get them done. And so I, after about three summers of spending, you know, at Chris's house, 
and, you know, eating dinner with his kids and stuff. <laughs> and I, I forgot if it was his son or his daughter saying, Dad, just how old is this data? <laughs> <laughs> and then when we told them that it was collected before they were born <laughs> and they were finishing college and graduate school, they got quite a chuckle. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> just like a fine wine, Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. We're also uh, pleased to welcome back uh, Dr. Clay Zimmerman back in the co-host seat tonight. So welcome back, Clay. Um, Chris, to get us started, you stated in the webinar that 75% of dietary nitrogen is excreted, which sounds uh, terribly inefficient. Um, but you also said that it contributes to greenhouse gases in the form of nitrous oxide. Can you talk a little bit about that and then talk a little bit about maybe some of the um, top line tools that producers have in their toolbox to help help mitigate these issues? Mm, OK, thank Yeah, I, I mean, that 75 percent, obviously, uh, that figure I quoted was based on a summary of uh, a large database of nitrogen balance measurements in cows where, where researchers had measured pro protein intake of cows and then excretion of nitrogen um, in the feces of the urine in the milk. Um, so only about 25% of the nitrogen was, was uh, uh, excreted as milk. And so, and the rest was a small amount retained in the body, the rest excreted in feces and urine. Um, and that, that excretion of nitrogen can have a number of effects. Uh, the the labile nitrogen can contribute to nitrous oxide emissions, as you referred to. Um, although in terms of, I guess, ruminant production agriculture, a lot of the nitrous oxide emissions are associated with fertilizer use for, for, for forage production. Uh, and also uh, uh, nitrogen that comes from excretion during grazing. So grazing animals, certainly that's the case here in the UK. A lot of our nitrous oxide inventory is is fertilizer use and then uh, urine and, and, and fecal nitrogen deposition during grazing or manure spreading. So, so the other ones are, are ammonia, of course, uh, which isn't a greenhouse gas per se, but, but it's a concern in terms of environmental impact. And then nitrogen um, leaching uh, as nitrate in, into groundwater. Um, and over here in the UK, we, we have historically had areas that were considered nitrate vulnerable zones where we had very strict regulations about spreading of slurry or manure and when we could do it. Uh, and th those nitrate vulnerable zones have been increased quite dramatically in recent years. Um, and interestingly, we, you know, we're now seeing more and more regulations around phosphorus as well. Um, and, and so in terms of toolboxes and in, in terms of trying to reduce that, that excretion, it's about improving efficiency. Um, and I think what we talked about in the webinar was around really moving towards precision feeding. I think feeding animals closer to requirements. Historically, we've overfed protein partly through using safety factors. Um, but if we can feed closer to requirements, if we can use some of the tools we have for balancing rations for amino acids, you know, th thinking about some of the some of the work that Mark been doing has, and his colleagues have been doing on on the new uh, uh, nutrient requirement system for the states, uh, then we can reduce that surplus uh, nitrogen that's being fed to animals as as, uh, as protein that that doesn't contribute to supplying essential amino acids to the animal. Hmm. You know, as a benchmark. Uh... Do we do we have a good feel today for what most producers are doing? And so do we know how much improvement can actually be made if we do adopt some precision feeding uh, techniques? Well, that's a really good question. And um, I think we, yeah, I, I don't know what the situation is in the States, um, but certainly you can go to specific farms. Uh, if you work with a, a, a nutritional advisor for a specific farm and you can look at their records, you can get, you can get a, a good handle. But in terms of national, nationally what's happening, it can be, it be, can be quite difficult to um, get good data on what's actually being fed on farms. Um, you know, a lot of it's considered uh, proprietary information. If, you, if you're working with a feed company, they might yeah. want to share their, their, their information. Um, and we've tried in the past to, to get 
information uh, just about the sort of state of the industry in some of these respects and and it can it, it's surprisingly difficult to do uh although although uh, there there are estimates that are made just based on on uh, surveys that are done of, of specific farm farming farms sorry in specific regions mm -hmm. i think um you know the case is different in the I, I don't know about many other countries but i do know in the netherlands uh, they've got a much better handle on it. They, they have um, uh, a good system for forage analysis, um, and so they have a, they have good data on the composition of the forages that are being fed, and they they have more specific information about uh, the other components of of rations that are being fed. And so, I don't know, Mark, what the situation is in the states in terms of being able to access data from some of the analytical labs uh, to get a to get a handle on that. Yeah, I mean, you can, it was certainly we access a lot of data to use for the NRC, but it's all on ingredients, right? And so you don't know what the diet is. And, uh, you know, my my perception on, on you know, a small number of farms that I would, or nutritionists I've interacted with, I think over the last 10 years with protein prices having been generally higher, uh, you know, historically relative to energy, that they have screwed down the amount of protein in the diet. And uh, I think there's lots of farms that are, operating you know high cow rations that are at 16 or even less than 16 percent even down to 15 percent but uh, to go below that i think then you have to pay a lot more attention to amino acids and that you know that was something that was still somewhat lacking so so i've seen numbers here in the u.s uh particularly when you know when you look at high cow diets that are you know obviously producing a lot of milk uh, in some of these cases, I, you know, I've seen groups with, you know, perhaps up to 35% nitrogen efficiency mm. in some cases, but I'm curious with both of you, you know, in your research efforts, um, what sort, what sorts of improvements have you seen in nitrogen efficiency through some of your research trials? We, you know, I, Chris probably needs to speak to what he saw on the, you know, his long-term trial, but, you know, let me contribute two things, I guess. I mean, one, because we've been historically studying amino acid responses, we can't interpret those without having a negative control that causes a loss in production. And 15 years ago, when we started running those trials, we thought 15% protein diets would be fine, you know, that they would always cause a loss in production. And I would say, probably at least three quarters of the time, you know, over the couple of years we did that, we didn't get a loss in production of 15 on high cow groups, okay? And so then we had to readapt and go to 14. And I know when we were working on the Snowball Project too, I think our standard sort of low protein diet was more like 13%. So I, I think 15 on well-managed dairies is, is probably fine in most cases. Now, I, now I've, you know, being old, Clay, I forgot the second part of your question. So, you know, I answered what I wanted to answer, which wasn't your question. And then you didn't answer your question. So, I, so uh, I'm curious, you know, if, if you calculate nitrogen efficiency oh, in these yeah, trials. We're, we're, we're at about 30, we're, we, we get about 35%, you know, on, on those diets where we start to lose production. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and our, we've not really our, gotten better than that. Sorry, Mark, our, our low protein you know, which was 14%, which was intentionally deficient in our system. Um, you know, we were around 33%, something like that. So efficiency definitely goes up, but you lose milk protein yield and, you know, you're, you're losing production. Um, so, and, and I think part of it depends on your, your sort of, um, your production system and your forage base. And I think energy is really important, Mark, in terms of uh, maintaining that, that higher level of efficiency and maintaining milk protein yield uh, at those lower protein um, concentrations. And, and, you know, here in the UK, we don't tend to feed as much starch. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think our high protein diet in our study was really short of fermentable energy. Um, we, we don't have a lot of maize grain to, to feed the cows. So we're, we're normally feeding much more degradable starch sources we use, uh, we, we, you know, it's often wheat and barley uh, or starch coming in from co-products. Um, for, for wheat, we, we would tend, a lot of producers would use something called soda grain or caustic treated wheat 
they they soak wheat in, with sodium hydroxide to soften it, and it feeds really well. It's really good feed, and it's it's you know it's it, it works. Um, but uh, and we're, we're using grass silages, ryegrass silages, um, and so you know we, we we do have a lot of producers. A lot of our higher yielding herds or bigger herds would be would be in areas where they can grow maize silage. It can, we can't grow it everywhere. Sorry, corn silage. Um, but uh, you know that makes a real difference when you have mixed forages, when you've got corn silage, and, and you're getting enough starch in. You can, I think, that energy effect is really important in terms of maintaining pro milk protein yield. So, yeah. so do your dietary starches do they tend to be in the low twenties? <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I always think about. Uh, I remember when the, there was a big push for for bioethanol in the states, and and corn was in short supply. And there were there, the, the the feed and nutrition conferences were focusing on feeding low starch diets. Right. But oh, that'd be interesting. So I looked at some of the results that were being presented, and the low starch diets being fed in the states were high starch diets for us. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, our my our, our farm manager was having kittens about our low protein diet because we were getting up to about twenty six percent starch and sugars. And that was considered, you know, worryingly high in terms of potential subacute ruminal acidosis. I think we're realizing now that it's not that's not a, as much of an issue as it was, um, or as people, you know, some people thought it was. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So, and back to the sort of protein levels being fed. Uh, you were asking about that earlier. We've definitely seen the trend over here in terms of protein levels coming down. Uh, our herd's currently at 16%. It was probably at 18 and a half when I came over from Ohio back in 2006. And there's a downward trend. Part of it is more strategic use of fertilizer. So our, our grass silages are, are lower in protein than they used to be. Uh, and so there's less protein coming in through the forages. Um, but also there, there's just downward pressure on using supplemental protein we, there's there's a real well um there's a lot of concern over here about feeding soybean meal uh because of consumer perceptions that sort of thing so a lot of our herds that are on consume uh, sorry on supermarket contracts they're not allowed to feed soybean meal and then more recently uh because of the ban on on neonic and uh, neonics uh we have more of a flea beetle problem with our rapeseed and so there's not nearly as much rapeseed be, or canola being produced. So we, we, we're having more issues with a supply of rapeseed meal. So that sort of put pressure on, on so that there's economic pressure and supply pressure that means people are looking at lower protein diets, plus concerns about environmental impact. Uh, is amino acid supplementation increasing in the UK? I don't, you know, I don't really have a good feel for that. Um, it's a good question. Um, but I, I'd have to say, I don't know. Um, to be honest, I don't know any producers that are feeding protected amino acids at, at this time. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know everybody, you know? So, so yeah. Mark, one of your, one of your uh, former graduate students <clears throat> did some survey work in this area, didn't they? A little bit. It was more on uh, nutritional, nu the nutritionists themselves, you know, what they were doing. And, I'm trying to get a sense of how much they were focusing on nitrogen efficiency. And I, w I was actually a bit surprised by that. I, you know, maybe people tend to tell you what they think you want to hear, right? And so that, that could be the, that what influenced that survey. But, you know, a lot of them, you know, at least answered that they were, you know, paying attention to that. And I sort of figured that very few of them were, that they were just letting it go where it may, you know, and, uh, and a lot of it, I think, has evolved. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate. And maybe people get upset at me for saying this. But, you know, when I entered the industry 30 years ago, things were all linear. And so we were using linear programming. And, and a lot of the good nutritionists were optimizing their rations with linear programming. And then when it went nonlinear and the nonlinear optimizers don't work as well, they're not as easy to use. They work fine. They're just not as easy to use. Okay. It required a retraining. And people just, I think in mass abandoned it. You know, it, it, they weren't they weren't fast, so they couldn't get answers quickly. They probably weren't very robust at the time, and so 
I sort of think that a lot of them are just saying, hey, I know this kind of diet works, okay? And I'm just going to put this diet together and that's what I'm going to stick with. And if it's 17% protein, then I'm just sticking with it because I know it works, right? And uh, it's, there's nothing like some some lean times economically to say, to make people actually reassess what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. But as, the, as part of our long-term project, we did have a stakeholder group and we, we, we did try to work with stakeholders, consultants, veterinarians, um, uh, feed compounders. Um, and again, people are reluctant to give you hard numbers. Uh, but the one thing that was clear in our dialogue and our, our interactions uh, with those stakeholders was risk aversion. The, the, the concern of, about the risk of lost milk yield or lost performance if when you t start taking protein out of the diet. Mm -hmm. You know, like Mark was saying, you've got a diet that works. And if you start tweaking that, you know, there's, the, the, there's that risk. And everybody's risk averse. And, and what we need to be able to do is provide the technology, um, you know, uh, perhaps if, for guys over here having a better way of assessing composition of their of, of their forages and, and, and how that varies over time so that they can formulate rations that are closer to requirements without having to worry about any drift in terms of component composition and things like that. Um, but I was also going to say... Uh, in reference to what we were talking about earlier, I did have a, um, a, a part three student, a final year undergraduate student. And, and our students over here, if they're on an honors degree program, they have to do a project. And uh, my student, Rosie, uh, for her project, she did a survey of protein feeding practices on farms. It was, it, you know, it's not something we could publish. It was people she knew, you know, she came from a dairy farm. But she also worked with some of the uh, dairy nutritionists in her region and got a got a good feel for people's attitudes towards protein. And most of the producers and certainly the nutritionists they were that were working with the farms that, that she interviewed were very aware of concerns about overfeeding protein and were thinking about ways to reduce protein. Uh, to try to improve protein efficiency. And Rosie was doing on-farm calculations of protein efficiency. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think the industry is moving in the right direction. Definitely. So Chris, I've got a couple of, I'm going to ask them one at a time. I've got a couple of questions about your, your, uh, your three lactation protein study. So I wonder if you could address these questions from that perspective and, Mark, I'm wondering if you could address it from a from an NRC perspective. So, Chris, my first question has to do with with fresh cows. You know, those cows the first thirty or so days in milk. Mm. Um, could you speculate on um, maybe you know maybe what's happening with with those cows feeding you know some of these lower protein levels in very early lactation and could it have made a difference maybe you know in early lactation milk and peak milk for instance mm. that's a really good question and it, as mark knows it's sort of a something we're really interested in and i guess you know we we've talked before clay but but just to just to clarify for our study because of our sort of calving system the the cows didn't go on to their experimental diets until probably about day four after calving something like that uh but they were you know they were recovering from calving they were getting back on feed and and getting onto their lactation rations but i am really i do really think that that very early lactation um period is really important in terms of setting set you know setting the cow up for lactation in terms of milk yield and milk protein yield and um but i i think there's a window of opportunity that's that's very early you know within hours of calving uh and and so we were we were missing that opportunity um but so so i think and, and some of the, the, the work that Moens Larson uh, has done in Denmark has, has you know, really highlighted that uh, using abomasal infusions of casein that start as soon as a cow calves and seeing some really 
dramatic increases in milk yield. So um, it's something, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of years. I'm, it's not something I'm going to be able to spend a lot of time researching, but I think it's an area that really needs a lot more research. So, and there's a lot of opportunities there. So, and yeah. Uh, and the other thing to say is we had done some work, oh, 25 years ago on so, sort of stair step protein levels. And, and we did the same thing with fat, uh, looking at, you know, um, changing levels at different stages uh, in the rising phase of lactation to, to, to see if we could have beneficial effects of protein in, in very early lactation that carried over. Um, and, I, and, and I think, you know, Moen's work shows that that can happen, but I think we started a bit too late. We were already a week in to lactation and we may have missed a window of opportunity by a week of, uh, by the, the end of the first week of lactation. Some some random thoughts. I hope that's okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, from a, from an NRC perspective, I mean it. It has to be based on the data that are available, right? And so, it just there just isn't enough data. I mean, you, know, you just sort of say, okay, well, we can calculate what it should be, you know, from a factorial standpoint, and then we'll set that as the requirement. And it's generally considered as safe, right? Which is more of our, our current sort of thought process on a lot of these things, given that our our idea of a firm requirement is sort of going away. But uh, I think that's probably not, well, I guess it depends on what you measure, right? I mean, we probably don't have enough cow observations, Chris, to know whether or not there is any health benefits out of some of these things we're doing. I mean, your long-term study was probably one of the few that, you know, if there was gonna be major health events associated with the low protein diets, they should have showed up in three years, surely, okay? And, uh, but most of our studies with three or six or even 10 week studies, they're not gonna show up. And I think the same thing around calving. I mean, we got most of our cow culling or, you know, our, our non-voluntary culling occurs around calving. And so I don't know, you know, I'm sure there's probably some dietary things that are influencing that. It's so bloody hard to figure that stuff out, though, because you need lots of observations, right? I mean, unless you can figure out some way to purposely cause them to have these things, you're now looking at running a thousand cow study to get enough observations to have a hope of being able to predict differences. Well, none of us can afford to do that in general. I mean, there just there just isn't that much money in research. So, so I, I think there's probably things there that we don't know. You know, yeah. Mm. Uh, two two things to add. Um, one is is my interest in that area is, is is about some of these essential amino acids as signals and sort of switching on protein synthesis in the mammary gland so so actually changing the requirement of the cow um, and the other is I've, 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 I have a concern that if in, in that in that case we might actually, increase yield to the to the extent that it, it increases um, energy deficit and you know which may, might make it more challenging in terms of uh, you know keeping blood non-esterified fatty acids uh, under control and avoiding high ketone bodies and that sort of th th some of those health issues uh, around that and I, I always think back to Bob Orskoff's old study where he was feeding cows grass silage and, and was supplementing them with fish meal and early lactation and he got so much of a milk yield response that he had to stop the study because they all got ketosis so yeah. you know um it, i think there's an analogy there it was a different the genetics of those cows was very different you know they were working with probably some pretty poor quality grass silages but they still got this big milk yield response to fish meal so and but yeah Mark, I mean Sorry, long, oh, yeah. the long-term study, you know, we were underfeeding protein, 90% of requirements and, in terms of metabolizable protein. And I was really impressed at how resilient those cows were and how few problems we had, um, you know, uh, we really did. It was just, it was just a, a, a reduction in fertility, uh, uh, especially in the third lactation. Uh, but otherwise, they, they, again, I'll just say it again, cows are really resilient. <laughs> Well, and it, it's good to know that because, you know, from an NRC standpoint or from any committee that's putting these together, you don't have data on this health stuff, right? And so you're you're hoping, you're, you're, you're basically making your recommendations based on production and you're hoping that 
when they produce maximally or produce at what you think is the maximum, that they also have already covered all their maintenance, you know, any any other health things and all that. But it's it's a blind stab. Okay, we 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 really don't have very solid evidence to to know for sure that that's true. Hmm. Yeah, Chris, can you can you remind me? Uh, so, in your long term study during the dry period. What levels of protein were those cows fed at that point? Oh, they were on our standard farm sort of dry cow uh, program with a three-week pre-expected calving close-up period. And uh, they, in the far-off period, I think they were, the, it was a crude protein concentration of 13%, as I, okay. as I remember. Um, now, normally in our herd, in the summertime, the dry cows would go out to graze. You know, so the, 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 the nutrition of those cows would be slightly different. Um, but our cows all, were all kept indoors all year round just to maintain. So they were on the, being fed the, the same formulation of diet. I mean, obviously, you know, it varied because the silage, uh, you know, there were, it was straw and some silage. Um, and uh, so that was, that was it. And then the, they had a close up period where they were getting more supplements, so some decad. Uh, and some lactation ration. Thanks. So my my second question related uh, first to, to your study, Chris, is um, so there were there were not uh, rumor protected amino acids supplemented during the trial. Could you, can you speculate on what may have occurred with the amino acid supplementation? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, uh, you know, there's a thousand ways we could have formulated more than a thousand different dietary formulations we could have used. Um, but I would just, just to say that our diets were based on a previous study we had run where we looked at the effects of level of protein and grass silage to maize silage ratio, uh, in a factorial experiment, a three by two. Uh, but it was in a changeover experiment with five week periods, but we, we had 14, um, 16 and 18% crude protein. But for that study with the, with those diets, we used a rumen protected soya product and, uh, our 14% crude protein diet was formulated to meet protein requirements and they did really well on that, but it was, but that, again, that's where we, I kept saying, okay, we had numerical reductions in milk yield, but it wasn't significant. And I kept saying, got to be careful. It's a changeover experiment. We don't, we didn't allow time for the cows to truly adapt to the diets. Thinking about what Henry Terrell told me when he was mentoring me at Beltsville about, you know, adaptations to changes in dietary protein. Um, and that was the genesis of the long-term study that, our DEFRA scientific advisor turned around and says, well, well, okay, let's do a long-term study. And, and so, yes, I think, you know, we, we did feed lower protein diets with rumen protected protein and the cows did really well on it. So. Yeah. Thanks. And there's other examples. There's loads of examples in the literature of that. Mark, would you, uh, you want to, speak to that a little bit obviously you're doing a lot of a lot of amino acid work in your lab well certainly the protein provides amino acids and so less protein is less amino acids and they actually require the amino acids and not the protein per se so hmm. so i think you know any any of those studies when you interpret them I mean, you're, you know we may be interpreting them historically from a protein basis but there is an underpinning on the of an amino acid uh, response surface. And I, I try to avoid saying requirement because it, you know, within the ranges of in vivo that, you know, that we look at typically, which I guess would probably range from maybe 12 to 20% protein as a, as a normal range, they appear to be linear responses throughout that range. So, you know, you can, you can add, pro, add amino acids to most of these diets and probably get a response. Will it cover the cost of the amino acids? Probably not when you're in the upper end of the range and maybe maybe more likely so at the bottom end. But again, they, they appeared linear all the way through. Now, I know from a biology standpoint, they are not linear forever, okay? They are curving off. It's just 
within the range of data we had, that's what we could see. Okay. And so, I mean, there was hints of, you know, Helene beat that and, and poor Roger Martin. Oh, I think she beat him up for about, you know, three or four months trying to demonstrate that, you know, she could work out those curves and uh, you could get the curves, you know, but they were not significant. So, I mean, you know, it would solve for them, but the linear ones solved just as good. So I think, you know, I would have to say, based on pure science and, and being a scientist, that if Chris had added amino acids to those diets, they probably would have responded. Whether they would have responded significantly that he could observe it, I don't know. But, you know, all the data suggests, you know, collectively that, yes, they would have responded. So, Chris, uh, my last question, maybe my last related to this, you did, a, I think you did a very nice job pointing this out during your webinar back in October. But, you know, one, one, th one thing we hear about feeding, you know, extra protein in these lactating diets is the day-to-day -day variation mm -hmm. in protein in these TMRs. Um, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's probably, you know, it, it's the data that came out of our long-term study um, that I, I guess really caught my eye when I first saw it. Um, and I, I probably get asked about it. I get more questions asked about that data, you know, than than some of the other responses. Uh, and just that we we were, it's it's just um, very notable data that for our clamps, you know, for especially for our grass silage, uh, less so with the maize. But you know, the maize, the corn silage has a lower protein concentration. And this is just talking about Keldahl nitrogen. So crude protein, it's crude protein concentrations. Um, we had s substantial variation from week to week, uh, which makes sense when you look at how the forage goes into our clamps. You know, it's, it, we're at the mercy of the weather over here. We're also at the, in our, for our farm, we're at the mercy of our contractors uh, who, who, are, who are chopping our silage and, and, and putting it in our clamps. Um, so you know it's going in as wedges in in, in a in, in a in a, uh, a silage clamp. So uh, I forget my terminology. A, a bunker. Bunker. Uh, yes. Silo. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we don't have upright silos. Very. You know they're very rare over here. Um, and so they go in as wedges. And so as you're working back through the face of a clamp, you know you're you're working. You have variation within the the face. Um, and, you know, as you move, you know, your block cutting and as you cut through, you know, you're getting variation there. Um, you know, uh, you know, Bill Weiss's project, you know, looking at variation in, in, in forage composition and its impact on, on production is, you know, fantastic work. And, you know, Bill talks about in some of his presentations about how to sample, you know, and how to, how to take this, these the tons of silage in a clamp and get that down to 500 milligrams that's used for an analysis, you know, and it's very challenging, but we do a really good job of, of sampling our forages and our, and, and our feed ingredients. There's, there's variation in terms of the analysis, but it was the same person doing the analysis week on week and we were using control samples. And I think the variation was real. So <clears throat> that's sort of the underpinning variation. Um, and I think, the, my sort of impression, one, based on our, our rolling average of, of the composition of those ingredients, we did make adjustments to try to keep within a, bo a boundary of just crude protein concentration, usually by adding a bit of soybean meal. Um, so we reduced some of that variation. Um, but again, the cows were really resilient. Uh, my impression is that uh, they, pr they produced to the longer term average it's not, you know, the day-to-day -day variation, it's kind of like variation during the course of the day and, you know, all the work around synchronization and cows being able to deal with asynchrony and, and produce to an average. And it's the same thing in terms of day-to-day -day variation. You, you know, it, it's when you get into weeks, uh, the weekly average, that's where you start to see the, 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 the movement in terms of production, I think. Uh, there's also that interesting story about oscillation and recycling and whether you could you can uh take advantage of of 
the ability of the cows to recycle and, and make them more efficient by, by intentionally oscillating protein. Um, but um, there's, in most cases, it doesn't have, it's looking at the literature, it's hard to find cases where it shows a positive effect. It often shows no effect compared to a control where you're feeding the same concentration every day, day in and day out. Um, but it's hard to show a benefit. There's a few cases, you know, where, 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 where you can see that. But, you know, I've always been fascinated by it. And it goes back to working with Bob Cochran at, at Kansas State years and years ago in the 1980s, talking about, you know, only supplementing protein to range cows once a week, you know, and them doing just as well as if you, as if you gave the same amount of protein on a daily basis. And it, and it, it always intrigued me. How do cows do that? You know, how, how right. you know, how, where is the protein going? You know, how do they make use of it? And, and it's, you know, the biology is fascinating. It really is. But yeah, yeah. I think that I mean, I hope from I, a ruminal know, standpoint, to the long term average, right? <laughs> but, you know, I think part yeah. of it is the ability to sort of recycle things and keep it in the system longer. But certainly, I, and so I think that's what helps buffer those day to day things. But if you, you know, if things are tight and you do sustain a deficiency, it looks like, you know, from the data that Vanderhaar's students published last year, and, and we saw it anecdotally, I think, with the Snowball Project, when we were creating these deficiencies, within a week, you, you have the maximum response. And even when we had animals that were deficient on Snowball and added, you know, back amino acids, you know, to, to study them, in the next milking, you could already see a response. So I think relative to energy, the responses are generally quicker but they can cover up that, you know, if it has to be sustained for more than one or two days, okay, before you can, you can get them knocked down. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think there's probably other things that are going on there that could have a long-term effect. But when you look at Vanderhaar's students study, I mean, I think they were 14 week periods or something like that. It was a crossover, you know, for 28 weeks, cows started on high or low, and then they crossed over to the other one. And he was using 14 and 18 or something. 13 and 17 maybe and you know the low cows lost four four or five kilograms of milk they as soon as they switched to diets they went back to the same curve that the other cows were on so it doesn't look like after maybe the first part of lactation that we actually changed the the machinery right we mm -hmm. we adjust the set point it's like your thermostat right we aren't shutting down and de lowering the size or decreasing the size of the furnace or increasing the size of the furnace we're just changing the thermostat and it can be changed back again later. But I don't think that that's probably the case in early lactation. I think that's what, you know, the group in Denmark is seeing. And we, we saw some evidence of that as well, looking at that first week or maybe 10 days. And I think that's about it. Because the mammary gland looks like it's still growing for that amount of time. And there may be opportunities to ramp it up and grow a little bit longer or grow faster and make that furnace get bigger so that when you turn the thermostat up, it does respond. Hmm. But I know when I was, was farming, you know, even before Chris and I met, you know, that, you know, all the extension people always told you, oh, you had to, you had to get cows to peak high because it was 200 pounds of milk for every pound of milk you got at peak. Well, yeah, anecdotally, that, that, that's statistics, okay? I mean, they're following a normal curve. You get them to peak one pound higher and then they hold that for another 300 days. That's how much you get. But everything we looked at since then says they're – you know, the machine reset, they, they, they'll run it up and down depending on what you're doing. Yeah. You can, yeah, you, can that was interesting. you can still get them to milk well in late lactation. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll never forget those protein, those amino acid responses, Mark, when we, when I first start, got involved in snowball and we were creating those, those protein deficiencies. And then we were infusing a mixture of amino acids, all the essential amino acids in the same ratio as milk protein. And within one, like you say, within m one milking, we'd see ninety percent of the response. Uh, it was it was really remarkable. But that was the whole point behind wanting to do the long term study is when you switch them, when you t stop those amino acids, it 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 didn't drop ninety percent at the next no, milking. It, you know, it took much longer for the for the milk protein concentration to come back down. And yeah, that's that's the whole basis of the long term study. Is but I, I think in those. Response. In those studies, I mean, we had them on grass silage, which generates, you know, a pretty low level of RUP, probably. It was a low protein diet. They'd already been on it for quite a while. I think all those cows 
were probably protein deficient in general to start with. And then we made them even more so. So I think once they saw some hint of some good nutrition, they said, ah, you know, it's Christmas time. Let's, you know, let's have a party. They, they responded <laughs> very quickly. We're not letting go of this again. <laughs> And it was a weird diet. I mean, John Sutton spent ages sort of trying to find low protein concentrates to put in the in the concentrate blend. And it was cassava meal and stuff like that. You know, it wasn't it, was, it wasn't UK feed ingredients. It was it was just what could we come up with that would produce a protein deficiency? Yeah. Another question, just uh, so f from a from a practical standpoint and looking at nitrogen efficiency, are there are there in, any indi indi indicators on the farm we could look at to really try to monitor nitrogen efficiency? Yeah, it's another question we talk, well, it's not the first time I've been asked that, um, definitely. Uh, I mean, obviously within a, a trial like ours, you know, milk urea response is, you know, very highly correlated with nitrogen efficiency. Um, and we, as, as part of our project, we were doing, we, we had collaborators at Aberystwyth. John Morby was running a trial at Aberystwyth, um, looking at different protein levels in uh, heifer rearing and then carryover effects into lactation. And then John also um, took those heifers and then followed them through two lactations on, and, and they were then, they were on low or high or, or normal protein for growth. And then they then were allocated to either low or high protein in lactation. And the idea there was also that our study was based on a, a high maize diet or more of an, in, what we would call over here, a more intensive production system. And in Avarice with, uh, they're, they're, they're more of a grass-based herd. Um, and slightly lower yielding. And so um, it was to sort of look at the same responses in a grass, but with a grass base. And we, d we also had a demonstration trial up at uh, SRUC, uh, Scotland's Rural University and, and, and Colleges um, a, a, a up at Crichton. And, and there it was just cows fed grass silage in the winter and grazing in the summer with some concentrate. And we had two levels of protein in that. Um, and for both of those studies, uh, with the grass base, we didn't get nearly the the response in terms of milk yield to to the lower protein. Uh, so they maintain reasonable milk yield on low protein diets. It was it was quite remarkable, and I was worried that that John had done something wrong with his diet formulations, where they were feeding it wrong. But you look at his milk ureas, and it was obvious the cows were on a low protein diet, and you know they were on the north, you know it's quite clear that they, they had the protein response, uh, but they, 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 the response was very different on a, on a really high grass silage basis. And Mark referred to grass silages and some of the differences you can get with grass silage. Uh, so milk urea, but uh, you know, we know there are so many other things that can affect milk urea. And, and so there's a lot of interest in other proxies or other indicators we could use. Um, we're part of a, uh, EU infrastructure project called, uh, it's an infrastructure for cattle research facilities called smart cow. And it's, it's just coming to a, a, an end. It's a four year infrastructure. Um, we're going to maintain it as a European research group. Uh, and we're also, we've also just found out yesterday, we're going to be involved in another infrastructure that's looking at sustainability across production systems, not just animals, but also crops. And um, for that project, we've been looking at some of these biomarkers of, of, of uh, sustainability and including nitrogen use efficiency. And the one, and INRA is leading this, uh, colleagues at INRA Tay and Clermont Franc, and um, they've been looking at uh, N15 enrichment. So the differential between uh, plasma, cow plasma, or other protein pool N15. Uh, enrichment versus diet in 15 enrich enrichment. And it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good proxy for nitrogen use efficiency. Um, and it's related to the, the amount of protein that, or the amino acids that are being catabolized in the liver. Um, and then there's just good old mid infrared spectra, 
And, you know, a lot of interest in can we predict nitrogen use efficiency from, from mid-infrared spectra, doing, you know, machine lear learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, if, and, and, you know, so we're, we're, we're very interested in pursuing that, Clay, in terms of, you know, something we might be able to use. Um, so not just spectra for, you know, urea or something else, but a combination of spectral properties that might be related to nitrogen use efficiency. Thanks. So those are some ideas for me. I don't know, Mark, if you've got any thoughts. But, you know, I think in the near term, you know, I think all those points are, are good ones. And, but, you know, today, I mean, I, even though there is factors that affect mercury and nitrogen, and some examples would be uh, high salt diets, you know, cause greater uh, urine excretion to get rid of that salt, right? Well, it, it carries the urea along with it. So if you feed a high salt diet, you'll have lower um, milk urea nitrogens. For, but within the herd, you know, as long as you aren't changing these background things, you have a fairly good benchmark. And so the, the key is, and this is a point I've made on a number of extension type talks is, you know, benchmark your herd. I mean, put it on a diet where you, it's basically at NRC requirements or whatever you, system you want to use, right? Just something that you have a benchmark. Figure out what the milk urea nitrogen is for your herd on that diet. And then you can probably start pulling some protein out. I mean, this is out of the old system. Certainly we were overfeeding RDP, right? So you could pull out a half point of that probably most of the time without any effect. It's going to lower milk urea nitrogen with a very repeatable and, and you know, sustainable amount, right? And so if, if nobody loses production and, and you don't lose dry matter intake, which is one of the big things that happens on these low protein diets, that's the first thing you see is dry matter intake goes down. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, you're done, okay? You got to go back again because this is not going to come back. But if you don't lose dry matter intake, you know, and, and, and if it was economically favorable, well, then now that's your new benchmark for your MUN. And then you can take some out of RUP and do the same thing maybe until you get it whittled down where you start to lose production, then restore it a little bit and say, okay, well, on my herd, under my feeding conditions, I'm at nine or I'm at 10 or whatever it is. That's your benchmark, okay? You, you know, it doesn't have to be the same as the next farm. It takes a little bit of effort to establish that for your farm, but there's a lot of money on the table here. So why not make use of the things that we have today? I, you know, I like the N15 approach. I haven't really studied up on that much, but you know, those, those have good precision, those kind of measurements. They're not as easy as MUN to make, but hell, it took the, you know, the, the American industry in about 20 years to figure out how to measure MUN reliably. And even today, I'm not sure we're doing it at all the milk co-ops. I think the DHI got it all sorted. <laughs> There's still some milk co-op numbers I see that are like, good Lord, man, go find out what machine they're using and tell them it's about 50 years old and throw it away and get another one or put it out the <laughs> And people call and say, my, my herd milk, you know, my, my MUN on my bulk tank samples, too. I said, well, are the cows all dead? Because if it's at two, they're all dead, okay? No, they're not dead. Well, okay, then the number's bad. <laughs> Mark, I, th I think I shared my personal story with you a few years ago where I was monitoring some herds and getting ones, ones to twos. Yeah. Coming back on months. And, and, and I made a phone call, and it, and the answer was, well, they were actually reporting negatives, but we wouldn't put that on paper. <laughs> so what, we just make up a one or a two, which is right. a bad negative. Right? Yeah. You know, those, old, those old infrared machines weren't really, they were able to do it, but it required a lot of fussing with the, to keep them in calibration. And, the you know, the DHIAs were doing ring tests, so they knew they were having trouble, and so they would stay on top of it. The milk co-ops, nobody's paying on MUN. No, it's a free service, and so it basically got the value back that you put in. Okay, you got almost zero value back. It's interesting. Uh, Mark Henry Terrell was running a, a, a lactation study at Beltsville, uh, I think, right after I finished my postdoc and moved into the energy lab with him. And uh, his uh, Patty, the the woman that looked after all his data, came in and said, "There's something not right with these proteins and fats." They've all changed. They just changed last week. And Henry was looking at the diet and going around, you know, oh, that farm must have done something with the ration that, you know. And finally, Patty called the the, 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 the lab 
They said, oh, yeah, we changed our standards. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, another another funny story from, from when I first joined tech was that, you know, I'd been working on protein stuff before Aparina, and, of course, none of that was getting published. And so there was one really important RDP study that I had run there that I felt needed to be, you know, published, and it was a dose response. And so I, I essentially redid the same study. And, you know, the low protein diet was 14 and then it went up to like 18 or something at four steps. And uh, the MUNs came back with a nice linear response, just like you'd expect, but like four units above what they were for the same essential levels of protein that I ran at Prina. So I'm on, I'm like Henry, I'm on a, on a mission trying to figure out what the heck is going on here, you know? And so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm usually not terribly astute, you know, with trying not to offend other people. But I, I realized that the DHI lab was upstairs. I realized I couldn't just go upstairs and say, hi, I'm Mark Hannigan. I just arrived here a year ago. We haven't met. What the hell are you doing with your MUN? <laughs> so, I, so I go over and I get the lab manager who I had met, right? You know, the, not the lab, but the DHI manager, not the lab manager. And I, I get him, and the, the poor fellow died a few years ago, so I can, you know, say this without worrying about offending him. But, you know, I decided, okay, well, I'm going to go talk to him. And then he's he's going to help me go up and, and sort of carefully sort of do this, you know, approach. And so I go over and talk to him, and I tell him, what the you know, what I'm seeing. He goes, okay, well, let's go up and talk to the lab manager. So he goes up to the lab, we go up to the lab manager. He goes in, he goes, hey, this is Mark Hannigan. He's a faculty member here. He started about a year ago. And he wants to know what the hell you're doing that's screwing up your I MUNs. Mean, like, well, I could have done that. I didn't need to drag you up here. <laughs> a lesson so in I, diplomacy, Mark. <laughs> I just screwed it over again. <laughs> uh, we ran ring tests and everything, and that's what led to that study we ran on that field study, looking at the sources of variation of, of MUN. You know, and we didn't look at salt at that time, but clearly there's a genetic component. I mean, you could get a over a percentage unit change from herd, I think it was a two percentage unit range across herds where everything else looked to be the same. You know, Now, maybe some of that might've been salt because we did not try to monitor that, but we we took everything else into account we could. And even within a herd, there was significant genetic variation. We know there's a genetic correlation. So there's something going on there, but it's still a good tool within a herd. Your herd's not gonna turn over on a genetic basis by next week, okay? So it's gonna be fixed whether it's high or low, okay? And and what it turned out was, is the tech herd was high. It's a high testing herd, or it used to be, maybe it's not anymore. And the mm-hmm. Prina herd must have been a fairly low testing herd. That's interesting. Mark, you mentioned genetics, and I, I was gonna come back to, to Clay's question about you know ways of monitoring. And I, th- I think one of our interest in proxies is having a tool to phenotype cows for nitrogen efficiency. Um, because, you know, if we can phenotype enough cows, we can start to then look at genetic correlations and, and is it a heritable trait? Um, and the, you know, that would be really useful. And, you know, that's part, you know, you mentioned Mike Vanderhaar's student study, uh, you know, that was really about it, it, you know, are some cows more resilient to low protein diets than, than, than others? And is it a genetic trait? Um, and we're really interested in that. And that's the other thing that, has been most interesting to me from our long-term study is the variation between between cows uh, on each uh, in terms of nitrogen efficiency on each on each of our experimental diets, and the variation was very similar whether they were on the low diet or the high diet. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure. Well, it is uh, related to feed efficiency uh, because we're just calculating gross nitrogen use efficiency so it's driven you know it's driven by intake and milk yield milk protein yield um and i think we need to to, to come up with a, a, a way of sort of measuring residual pro- metabolizable protein intake or something like that and uh, to in order to assess it but we are really interested in in you know is there a, is it a genetic trait that we could select for in terms of nitrogen efficiency or is it just feed efficiency but you know, or is it feed efficiency and some other components of, of perhaps metabolism or other aspects of, of, of milk production that, that that's heritable so we could select for it? 
And, when I, you know, you talk about gen genetic differences in, in milk urea concentration, mm -hmm. Mark, there's a, there, you know, that's related to that. Well, and I, you know, we published a study last year and it had been, it's a bit like some of the snowball data had gotten fairly long in the tooth before it got published. And, and we had some challenges, you know, the student did with uh, some of the nitrogen analysis to begin with. And a postdoc got it sorted out a year ago after like a 10 year hiatus. And essentially we were asking that question. Is there variation among cows uh, in their ability to transport urea back into the rumen and probably also to excrete it in urine because they're the same transporters uh, on a common diet? And the answer was yes. I mean, you put, put these eight cows on a common diet and, they, and we picked them to have high or low milk urea and then we looked at the urea transport and the urea transport was what was driving that. There, some cows are better at putting urea back from blood back into the rumen and recycling than other cows. So I would just point to the fact that in the US, you know, we, you know, when we select for milk production over the last hundred years, we're primarily selecting for energy efficiency because we're providing more than enough nutrients, right? Other nutrients. All the vitamins and minerals are generally fed above requirements because we don't know for sure what they are. We've just had a long discussion about we generally have probably fed protein above requirements because we didn't have a good idea what they were and everyone's risk averse. That means almost all the genetic selection has been energy efficiency selection. So if you look at what we did when we uh, just selected for milk production for about 100 years and didn't pay any attention to breeding efficiency, it went away, right? And, and now we're paying attention to it and it's coming back. And you know what, the, the New Zealand people that had to get animals bred within a, a two or three cycle period so they would keep in sync with the uh, forage and, and the milking cycle, they didn't have any trouble with their breeding because they culled all those cows, okay? They put genetic pressure on it. We've put no genetic pressure on selection for nitrogen efficiency to this date. So I would be, I would be willing to bet a large amount of money that there's plenty of genetic variation we can select from for that. And I'll bet you we can make a lot of progress because we've totally have ignored it. For a long time. Yeah. Gentlemen, this has been a stimulating conversation, but I think we're going to need to call last call here, Chris. I know you've got some place to go. Um, with that, I'd like to ask each of you guys to give us uh, kind of two takeaway messages that uh, either a dairy producer or consulting nutritionist, veterinarian uh, can take away from the conversation today. And Clay, why don't we start with you? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, uh, certainly one topic we hit on is, you know, is the importance of, of fresh cow nutrition, you know, from from a from a nitrogen standpoint. So uh, I think we need to remember not not to overlook that um, when, when we're talking about, uh, you know, nitrogen and, and amino acid nutrition and um, the other point, which Chris, you hit on this a couple of times, is uh, is how resilient these cows are, at least in the short term, hmm. to these day to day variations. So it's um, it's it is pretty remarkable what what can happen in the short term. Long term is a completely different uh, story. Yeah, but, thank you, Clay. So just to add to add to that, for my you know two answers, I guess Scott is that. Uh, we didn't really talk about this, but when you look at what the amount of milk loss was on Chris's diets or many other diets, relative to what the old NRC and other models that have been in use for quite a few years would predict was the loss, it's usually about a third of that loss or maybe a half at most. Okay, So if we go back to this idea of risk aversion, the, the perceived risk was about twice what the real risk was. Okay, And so this is not as risky of a decision as you would think. And I remember one of the mantras, you know, from the administer, the, you know, the people that were managing us at, at Perina was the easiest decision to make is one that's reversible. You're not going to damage the cows by, by losing a little bit of milk. Okay. Pay attention to it. Make your reduction. See if you get a loss within a week. If you haven't got a loss in a week, it's not going to happen. And, you know, go on down the road. And if it does happen, just reverse it again. So you lost a little bit of milk over a week. It's half or a third of what you thought you might have lost on the milk system. So I think, I think that's one key point. And the other one is, you know, spend some time to try to, to titrate that uh, protein feeding down to make the animals more efficient. It's good for the environment. It's good for your pocketbook. Okay. 
You can use MUN to help benchmark this to keep it on track, you know, and take some of that money and probably invest it in your fresh cow program. Put some, put some more goodies in that. It, it might pay dividends and uh, everyone will be better off. Yeah, great advice, Mark. Hmm. And Chris, uh, as our featured guest, uh, what thoughts do you have? Final thoughts? Well, well it's, one, just say thank you very much for the opportunity to have this conversation. And thanks to Mark for coming along. Um, I always enjoy talking to Mark. And, uh, I, and it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. So thanks very much. Uh, you know, I, I think, yeah, there's, I think as an industry, uh, we need to be looking at improving protein efficiency and th there's lots of benefits as mark just said and i think you know uh, certainly there's a lot of concern out there about environmental impacts of our production systems and and so let's take some steps and i think but i think we can move in the right in that right in that cor direction towards more efficient um uh, production with less environmental impact uh mark's absolutely right i think the risk is perhaps not as great as, as many people have thought. Uh, and so I think we should, it's something we should be doing uh, in terms of sort of two takeaways for me. Um, I think one of them is this variation in animal uh, efficiency. And I think, we, you know, we should be looking to see if, if we can use genetics to reduce environmental impacts and including, including in that nitrogen efficiency and, and improved uh, efficiency of dietary nitrogen utilization, dietary protein utilization. Um, and, you know, I think we need to, we, we need to think about this variation in diet composition. Um, how much of a problem is it, is it really? Uh, and where it is a problem, how, how can we address it? Uh, and, and, and really there I'm thinking about minimizing risk again. Okay, let's 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 get a good handle on understanding the risk. And I, I referred to Bill Weiss's project, looking at this, where they intentionally made variations, and the you know the negative effects weren't as substantial as everybody thought they might be. Um, so let's let's understand what the, the true risk is, um, and then if it is important, let's let's see if we can apply some technology, some creative thinking to to how to how to address it. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent comments, guys. This, this has been great. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. And honestly, I'd look forward to doing it again sometime. I'm sure our, 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 our audience will have a bunch of uh, questions. So we'll make sure we get this uh, scheduled on the docket again. We'll see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Thank you to all the loyal listeners of the Real Science Exchange. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.